Thus says the Lord. A voice is heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Verse 4, the ancestors of Vimiatha, which is Swahili for the great disaster. For my direct ancestors, I acknowledge the trauma in so many of the persons of language and culture, but I also celebrate our collective survival and our collective resistance, and I honor their memory. Ashe. With her dying breaths, Rachel named her child Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrow. This was the perfect name for a child born to a mother such as Rachel. Then Israel journeyed on, kind of matter-of-factly. With that, we expect never again to hear of or from her, but yet on his deathbed. In Egypt, Jacob mourned for Rachel one last time. Yes, Jacob remembered Rachel, but Israel journeyed on. Up to this point, nothing in the record of Jeremiah's prophetic career gave reason to expect anything but the end of Israel and Judah. All was now lost except for Rachel's lament. We would love to skip past this scripture of Rachel's weeping, actually any lament. We would rather go straight to the things of, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. We don't want to hear the lament like words, we look for peace but find no good, for a time of healing but there is terror instead. We don't like the blue and broken notes of scripture. We don't like to ask, is there no bomb in Gilead? Or why is God so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent a help in a time of trouble? These are piercing questions of lamentation from groans and tears of a people that embody the prophetic ministry grief. Here, Rachel is prophetic because she refuses to be silent, to shrink back from the raw grief of life. She is a prophet for such a time as this. Speaking to those who want to quick fix and in turn take the prophetic voice of grief and attempt to silence, control, or dominate discussions. Sometimes it shows up in microaggressions or NDAs or the belief that those in positions of privilege and power are marginalized. But prophetic grief is a form of lament that the body proclaims something ain't right. And it is the ultimate form of criticism. See, listen, the prophetic grief of real lament should be embraced as a real part of our spiritual practice here in this church. To look honestly at suffering rather than with numbness, fear, self-deception, denial of reality, all in the hope to maintain the status quo of white supremacy behaviors. Those supremacy behaviors of urgency, defensiveness, Perfection, only one right way, paternalism, power hoarding, just to name a few. It is, you see, the prophetic grief is an act of resistance and prayer. It is Billie Holiday keening the words, southern trees bear strange fruit. Blood on the leaves and blood on the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Or today, like Toby Nwade would say in his lyrics, because the world can be so toxic, especially when your skin looks like chocolate. At one point they sold us for profit, but we made it out on the gauntlet we chose it. See, Billy and Toby are not singing to cause the audience to fall into despair, but to empower all who hear 
together the lament to make real and lasting and powerful change. These artists, like the marginalized communities, the vulnerable, lament like Rachel today saying, I will not allow you to cover your ears or your eyes. The inconsolable cries of Rachel insist that in some situations, especially when innocent suffer, all glib assurances amount to blasphemy and it disenfranchises people of color. What Rachel does is refuse all the false comfort and weak explanations. Hear her voice. That's the voice that God hears. Today we see the acceptance to believe anything that will make us feel comfortable and accepted as the word of God. Rachel's refusal becomes a most timely witness to how her lament made a way for something new. Church, we have been experiencing and just witnessed the laments. And we have to hear these laments against white supremacy culture. Will the church be like Israel and just journey on after this weekend, after this week? Can we look at the prophetic tears in the eyes and turn it into a powerful witness? Reverend Moss says it this way, the very nature of the faith is carved from the splintered wood of an unfinished democracy. This is the faith where miracles are not anomalies. Redemption is not a fairy tale and deliverance is more than a descriptive adjective, but an active verb permeating the soul of every believer. This is a faith of Harriet Tubman and how she learned of freedom, or Zora Neale Hurston found her literary power. You see, church, it's easy to deal with the who, but we are not ready to deal with the what. White supremacy on May 14th, Topps Grocery Store, Buffalo, New York, in the upstate New York Senate, a young man drunk on the wine of white supremacy, high on the ideological opium, radicalized thinking, killed Roberta, Margis, Andre, Aaron, Geraldine, Celestine, Hayward, Catherine, Pearl, and Ruth. But it's not just that one man. It is also our church that has taken the ideological opium through our very veins. Church, will we deal with the what? Or will we, like the people of Israel, just journey on? Ashe, Ashe, Ashe.